Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Bowling Explained. This is episode number three. I'm Jason Thomas, your host. We've got a special treat for you today. Uh, we've, we're going to talk about, for the first time on the show, the topic of equipment. I know it's it's always a big topic in the world of bowling, especially in the last you know 20 years or so, uh, with the proliferation of all the different equipment that's available. Uh, it's become a huge area of education. Um, so important to understand equipment in uh, in your development as a bowler. Um, you know, the, I know the ball companies have done a, a fantastic job with diversifying their lineups and providing educational information for you know pro shop owners and consumers. Um, but you know, I think in a lot of ways, it, it's even more important to know the numbers so that you can understand you know the differences between balls you know crossing you know, brand line. So uh, that's a huge, important piece. We're going to talk a lot about that today. And, you know, it's also important because, you know, it's expensive to buy equipment. So, you know, you want to make the most informed decisions possible when uh, you're you're filling out your arsenal. And uh, so we're going to talk about that today. And we've got one of the premier experts in the sport to do that with us here today. He's the, uh, the pro shop manager and coach here at the ITRC. He's a USBC gold level coach, one of the few uh, that we have in the world. Um, he, in, before he came uh, to work here, he's a guy that I, I, I spend way too much time downstairs talking to whenever it is that I go down there. Um, but, you know, he, he was instrumental in a number of things uh, throughout the industry before he even came here to the ITRC. He was the president of the International Rolling Pro Shop and Instructors Association. Uh, he worked with uh, Turbo 2 and one um, where he created the, the fitness and training curriculum for TurboTech. So he's just made, you know, a number of huge contributions to the sport over the years. And uh, we're going to bring him on the show here now. Uh, also, I, I want to mention, uh, if you do have any questions, you know, for Lou, you know, feel free to, to ask them in the, in the chat below. And we'll either get to them on the show today or, or we'll answer them afterwards, uh, you know, right there in the chat. So, so uh, Lou, how are you doing today, sir? Doing great. Thanks, Jason, for asking. Good, good. What what have you been up to lately? You know, with the pandemic, you know, just trying to work our way through it, making sure that we're all healthy, but also, you know, working with our bowlers that are still in search of, you know, getting their games sharp for the season. You know, we've got a lot of passionate bowlers out there that still want to tune up. They 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 want to push forward through this and uh, kind of get beyond 2020 if they all can, you know. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure everybody's looking forward to getting uh, beyond 20. 2020 at this point. Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, equipment. So uh, mentioned it at the, at the top of the show, how important a topic it is now, especially in the last, you know, 20, 25 years or so. Um, talk a little bit about how you, uh, you know, developed your, you know, background in understanding equipment. Well, you know, as a pro shop operator uh, for many, many years, you know, looking at the different conditions that bowlers uh, are faced with when they're bowling you know you have a lot of bowlers that you know just were typically a house bowler so the patterns would have been you know pretty typical from bowling center to bowling center you know fairly easy shot more of a recreational base but now there's a lot of bowlers just searching for competition that's the one thing that i love about this sport that we do have that group of dedicated bowlers that are just looking to expand their range and not only versatility with their physical body but also in their equipment. So it's important for pro shop operators to really understand every bit of the equipment that's available to them. So these tournaments are almost, almost you almost find a ball specific to a tournament pattern nowadays. You know, a lot of people flock into urethane um, or aggressive reactives or maybe even certain layouts or certain RGs that they're using specifically for certain conditions. So. You know, you got to be up on your game if you're in the pro shop business, as well as the player. You know, you yeah. got to have a, a better, more well-rounded knowledge of what do these things do and how do they do it differently. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's who we want to be talking to today, of course. And and you know, I know when we talk about arsenals, you know, uh, the first thing people say is, "Gosh, it's just so much. It just costs so much money. I can't afford, you know, to keep building an arsenal." But it doesn't really mean. You know, I think what we're saying here isn't isn't necessarily that hey, you got to buy twenty bowling balls in order to you know bowl your 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 once a week league. It it, yeah. it it's 
you know, if you just if you just have one bowling ball and you know what it is you're bowling on, it's important that that be the right ball, right? Absolutely. Uh, the the one thing, if you're the bowler that's you know limited on equipment, um, the biggest thing that you can then do um, to have versatility with that equipment is to alter the most easiest thing, which is the surface. You know, having to try to different layouts in one ball, well, that's you know that's going to be more wasteful money because you're plugging and redrilling, but having a base drilling that you're comfortable with and then just altering the surfaces, you know, all the way down from 360 all the way up to high glossy polish, you know, you're going to see a wide array of reactions, you know, through the different levels of surface changes, um, you know, and then the other biggest change that you can do, and it's actually more, more so than the ball itself is what you as a bowler can do with that ball, you know, changing your physical ability. It's going to have a big effect on what a ball does, you know, going down the lane, changing your rotation, uh, tilt, not so much. That's a little hard for a lot of bowlers to change, but changing that axis of rotation, you're just changing that hand position of where you exit out uh, at the release point. That's going to be huge on the lane as far as motion. So yeah, you know, I, having I, I, out of your bag is, is important. Yeah. I, I know uh, we were going to get to that at the show at, to, in the show at some point, but uh, since you brought it up, we might as well, you know, talk about it now. Um, you, you provided me a couple of different videos that I want to show on the screen, and and um, I, I believe this was all the same bowler, same bowling ball, correct? Yeah, we, these this is a a bowler that we've been using as a model in our industry quite a while. A lot of coaches use the same video, and uh, it's a good, really good explanation of what can happen you know, when you change the, the versatility of your body. So um, this bowler is using the same ball, same lane condition. And what you're going to see is the shape of that motion being controlled by their release. So, um, you know, here we're simulating a short pattern. And you can see how the type of ball roll you'd want to emulate on a short pattern and the location of where you're playing. So you see this bowler is more from up the back of the ball. They're rolling it more forward. OK, now I don't know if you see it, but there's a little dot on the ball that actually is illustrating his axis of rotation. There it is solid. And then you see it, you know, starting to flare out. Um, that's the actual bowlers uh, PAP. Yeah, right there. Yeah. 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 So that according to the video, that's a 20 degree axis rotation, correct? Yes. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Pretty so stable. You know, you, you, if you're playing down the boards, you know, and, and more parallel or more front to back as people play it, um, call it, um, you know, that's be a, a hand position you'd want to use, you know, and have that in your wheelhouse somehow. OK, so now uh, and this is amazing when we walk through the full range of this, I think people out there are going to be amazed. And this is just the same ball, same surface, uh, same layout. Uh, so it's 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 really it just really shows you know the different shapes that a single uh, ball can make. But this is a forty five degree. Yeah. Now notice that this bowler is actually rolling it way closer to the foul line. Now I wouldn't recommend that all bowlers try to do this, but you can see that you know this bowler is opening up the lane a little bit more. They increase their hand position, the, the axis of rotation, got around it a little bit more. Um, and now you see the same force. We didn't alter the ball. We didn't change anything on the surface of the ball. All we did was increase the rotation angle, and the bowler probably dropped their ball speed by maybe less than half a mile per hour. And you can see how it starts to open up that angle down lane, and it increases the back end entry angle, you know, giving the bowler uh, the ability to strike even more. Okay, now this one is, is pretty crazy. Uh... So this is 80 degrees of, of axis rotation. Um, and, you know, not everybody, you know, is, is talented enough to be able to go from 20 to 80 degrees, right? Yeah. But uh, this just kind of shows you how much diversity there is. In yeah, that's the big wheel, as we call it. You know, yeah. you, you can really see the power of what the hand can do. You know, that range and versatility, um, you can't buy that. You know, you can't get pull that off of a, a display in a pro shop, you know, and expect to have that, you know, in an arsenal. That's physically, you know, created. Um, and the, the big thing here is that this range of versatility 
can help guide any bowler in the natural transition process that happens with lane play. You know, last week uh, you talked uh, with uh, Tom Frenzel and I was catching a little bit of that show. And, you know, he was talking about how Earl, you know, investigates, you know, the lane play process. But you can tie this right into the human element now. What does the bowler have to do? Well, we've got to increase our axis of rotation and learn that skill set when bowlers, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, that's all they had. They didn't have many bowlers. Right, right. They had that skill set. And that's, I think, what is the most lost art, you know. I mean, granted, equipment plays a big portion today if you're not having a big vers versatility range in your physical ability. But if you can couple that up, you know, a versatility window that's wider and equipment, well, that's that's the that's the magic ticket right there. That's, right, right. You know, that's nirvana. You know? Yeah, so. yeah, for sure. And, it, you know, it, 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 it really is about filling gaps, right? I mean – you know, for example, that bowler that we just watched, there's a huge range just within one ball of the different shapes that player can make. And yeah. but but let's say the you know you know person was only able to throw the ball one way, like a 20 degree axis rotation, you probably could find them a ball that would allow them to play that third angle, correct? Yes, you can. You you can. Um, then that that you have to really now start to look at, you know, what's the configuration of that ball. You know, what's the makeup of it? Um, where is it more suited for? You know, what volume of oil that it's more suited for? Um, and that comes down to its construction, you know, cover stock type, you know, how aggressive that cover is, um, what the core numbers are, the RGs and the differentials, you know. And then the drilling, the drilling is just controlling the amount of flare that we're using. Right. So you have you have a presentation that you, that you give, I know, that um, – you know, matches up a bowler style to, you know, different ball types, correct? Yes. Now, what, what exactly are you looking at when you're, when you're going through that presentation? What are you trying to get across to the, to the people that, that you're presenting to? Well, when I, when I show this presentation, you know, several times, I, I try to give bowlers an illustration of, you know, first off, what did the manufacturer's intent was when they built this ball? You know, was it meant to rev up quickly, you know, and grab aggressively on the lane? You know, and we would look at that as the manufactured RGs. Um, so if we have a ball that starts up with a very low RG range, that means that the ball's spinning up a lot quickly, you know, when you initially release it. It has the least amount of resistance to, you know, revolutions. So we're going to get this thing revving up. But if you're a bowler that has slower ball speed, well, then that might rev up a little too quickly for a condition that you might be bowling on. Or if you're a bowler that has more speed and you're using a similar ball, and let's keep everything at the same, rev rate the same, rotation the same, tilt the same. Well, then now just increasing the ball speed pushes that RG further down away from the bowler. So they're not always going to start up, you know, on the in the lane at the same distance even though you may have similar, you know, uh, uh, ranges in your versatility, you know, if your speed is different, that's a big factor. It's going to push further things down or closer to us, you know, so we have to take that into consideration. That's a big thing. Yeah. And so, you know, that's, that's, I think the important part about understanding the numbers and filling the gaps, right? Like you, if you understand that, you know, you, you have you need a ball that that picks up a little sooner than anything you have in your arsenal, and 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 you've you've kind of identified it down to you know an RG level. What what would you recommend to somebody who's looking for that ball reaction? Well, if you're looking for a ball reaction, you know again it's all based on where you want to see your ball start to change direction or or start to you know get a hold of this lane condition. Um, what we don't want in building an arsenal is is try to have duplicates of the same ball that's a no-no you know we really don't want to do that at all you know you can always alter them by other other means but if you've got let's say a 2.46 you know the next ball should be probably a 2.50 or a 252 you want some separation there you know so that your ball energy where it starts to you know interact with the lane isn't happening in the same spot Every time you change balls, you know, the lanes change it, you know, as you're bowling, 
you don't want to have the same ball that you just, you know, you're thinking about switching to, and then you're going to another ball and it's the same ball. It's starting in the same location. What you're looking for is how do I manage this energy further down the lane? Because the lane is depleting, you know, it's getting drier. It's right. getting, you know, we're, we're chasing it in. Right. So, Having right. different RGs are important. Yeah. And I, I was never a bowler that light. I mean, I, I would at the most usually carry about 12 bowling balls, which, you know, for some people, that's a lot. That's a lot. But uh, there was always a ball or two in my arsenal that I felt like I was never using because it just, there was always a better option. Um, but I would never get rid of the ball. Because I would say, okay, well, there's always there's going to be a time when this is going to be the best option, and it would just never happen. But but you know if you if you're you know looking to not spend a lot of money and not carry around a bunch of extra bowling balls that you're not going to use, how can you avoid you know drilling something you know like that? Well, you know, it, obviously having a conversation with your pro shop operator um, is to you know that's a, that, that's obviously important. But you know from a a self analysis, I would make it a priority that every bowler make a list, you know, write down what this ball is intended to do, you know, make an Excel spreadsheet or just, you know, anywhere in your phone and just start documenting where things are in your arsenal. You know, you can classify them by RG numbers. You can classify them by differential numbers. Um, you can also, importantly, is classify them by cover stock types, you know, as well as maybe cover stock strengths. Well, speaking yeah. of a spreadsheet. There you go. Yeah, you red, red, you, you yeah. happen to do that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it, this is a little cheat. It was just kind of something that, you know, we kind of developed. Um, and it's just helpful just to kind of put eyes onto my bag. You know, they're not just round objects in my bag occupying space, they give value to what it's supposed to do. You know, so on it, you'll have a classification of the ball, um, what the surface is, you know, because a lot of times we forget, you know, we use a ball, we maybe altered the shit, that surface. And then we forget that what was it two weeks ago, you know, yeah. since you used it. Yeah. So now you can kind of go back and, you know, and look at that number and go, Hey, maybe I need to freshen this up or, you know, I like a certain reaction. Well, you can go back in and, and reapply that surface to it. But at least you have something tangible, you know, you can actually look at it, you know? So yeah. RGs are important for there because that gives me an idea of where this thing is supposed to, you know, start to rev up. Um, my surface numbers are important in this chart. Um, and then when the manufacturer creates a ball, what was the intent? Is it a ball help made for, you know, larger volumes or medium volume or light volume, you know, um, pattern lengths also could come into play here. You know, you, you might use that. That might be helpful. Um, but you know, any, any information that you can put onto this chart is going to be helpful to you to really, you know, understand what's in your bag. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I found, um, because I, I grew up bowling, you know, in the, in the era when there weren't a lot of bowling balls, you know, to choose from. And so for me, it was always pretty easy. I, you know, I'd have, you know, six balls and, you know, it kind of limits your options and you just learn how to throw the ball a bunch of different ways. But then when I came back and bowled, you know, after about 10 years, not bowling, uh, all of a sudden there were a million choices, you know, with bowling balls. And so, uh, being who I was wanting to be competitive right away, I purchased like a full arsenal of bowling balls and I made a huge number of mistakes in, in doing that. Uh, most people don't do it that way. Right. I mean, most people don't go out and buy six bowling balls or 10 bowling balls to build their arsenal. It's, it's more of a, a one ball at a time type process. Right. Yeah. It, you know, it, the progression I see more often um, from a lot of my bowlers that I, that I work with is, um, they'll have a ball for, let's say, a fresh environment, you know, or a heavier volume, you know, something to do is start in game one, you know. Um, and as the lane transition, um, they need something to allow them to move inside a little bit more from that, that worn out area they've been bowling on and then try to find something that they can create a little more shape with 
as the lane dries out. So we need the ball to get not only a little further down the lane, but it also has to recover a little bit more, you know? Uh, so they'll go to a, let's say a ball that's more geared towards that volume where it's depleted now. So it's more medium versus fresh, you know? And then obviously at the end of the day, um, you know, you might be able to use that ball till it's done, you know, to your, to your, your league is done or your tournament's done. But if you're, if you're that competitive bowler that goes out, you know, on the weekend and you're bowling a six game or eight game event, or, you know, you're coming back multiple blocks of re-oiling, you know, these, some of these marathon tournaments that we have out there, you're going to need a little bit more versatility in your arsenal because they may not re-oil and right. you're bowling on the burn, you know, so right. you've got to be able to handle, you know, as if it was fresh to you with your arsenal. Yeah, I, I know one of the problems I used to run into, you know, in my personal experience was uh, you, know, you bowl an eight gamer, there's no way you're going to throw the same ball from start to finish. Almost, I mean, unless it's a yeah. short pattern and and nobody's playing, you know, where you're playing, you're not, you're going to have to make ball changes. But I, I, I always had my my quest one one league season was to drill a ball that I could throw from the start of league to the end of league that night. I never got to the point where that was the best strategy. I was always either throwing a stronger ball and having to make a ball change towards the end of game two into a weaker ball um, or throwing a weaker ball and, you know, trying to stay in that ball the whole time. But I would always lose something at the front end of the, of the three game set if I threw the weaker ball from the start and I'd always lose something at the back end of the three game set if I threw the stronger ball all the way through the night. So it always ended up being a situation where I had to change balls. Is that something you think that, you know, bowlers should be planning for or should they be trying to find that ball that they can throw for, for a whole, you know, three game league set? You know, that's, that's, wow. That's, it's like a magical unicorn, you know, <laughs> <laughs> nowadays. Yeah. Um, you know, it is, it is almost impossible. I, number one, you know, me personally, I'm going to advise my clients uh, that I work with. And number one, you got to have a minimum of two, you know, it's, it's got to, you got to have a spare ball. That's the most important ball in your bag always. So that's a polyester or a really hard shelled urethane that really doesn't have much dynamics. Um, and then obviously some kind of performance ball. Um, if you're going to stay with one ball, I probably would end up making it the middle of the road ball, like kind of a benchmark ball, not the most aggressive, but not the weakest. And then what I would do is alter the surface and let the surface change as you're bowling with it. Because we know now from a lot of study on surface application to a ball, you can bowl with a ball with, with fresh surface on it, but by game three, the ball's almost polished up. So right. it's kind of morphing into what you want it to be, but you'd have to do this every week, you know, yeah. to have that idea, you know, of controlling the fresh and then it lasts to the end. But nowadays it's almost impossible, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's hard to control with one ball. Right. You know? Well, I know, I know also that flair plays a big role in that, um, you know, and I know you have in your, in your presentation, just kind of, you know, some, some, uh, some examples of uh, flaring balls versus non flaring balls. And, um, you know, I, I, to go back to the example I was using before, you know, it would seem like a lower flare ball would, would, you know, when you're talking about the ball kind of evolving over the course of, of the league session into what you want it, it would seem like a lower flare ball would do that much more so than a higher flare ball, correct? Yeah. It, you know, you, you probably have more success with a little less flare and then you could use um, surface more, you know, to make the changes that you need. Um, if you use too aggressive of a flaring ball, in other words, you max it out. It's, it's the most dynamic possible and you put the most surface on it. You can almost burn this ball out and, and it reacts kind of weak down lane because it used up all its energy in the front part of the lane. Um, in this illustration, we're just showing you some different – and again, this is a basic illustration of what happens when you start moving the pin to control your flare. So here in this uh, is just showing uh, symmetrical flaring dynamics um, where it's a strong pin position. Uh, you know, center of gravity, probably in a strong position as well. Um, 
But if we start to move that pin around, you're going to see some subtle changes to the flare amount. And now we use the, the ball on the illustration on the left there of the screen, and you'll see it. we're moving the pin closer to the bowler's positive axis point. Creates a tighter flare band. Okay, so that gets the energy to start, you know, interacting with the lane a little sooner. So getting control of the, the front part of the lane a little bit more. Um, and if we move that pin further out, um, you know, just beyond uh, that strong position, um, that's going to start to expand that flare again. Um, and then if we move it further, there you go, we move it further away, and it tightens up those flare bands again. So you have some range of versatility by moving the pin around, but I think optimally it's up to the bowler to find what works for them. You find a lot of pros, um, they, they stick to a, a basic thought. Um, they don't like experimenting so much by moving a lot of pins. You know, they're not into the big numbers, you know, you know, uh, 40 by, you know, by three and a half by, by 20 or whatever. They're not into all that. They pretty much have a standard number that they're comfortable with. And they're probably more often going to use a little less flare, you know, and they're going to replicate that in every ball that they punch. They like having standardization because they like the control of altering the surface. Right. Which is the biggest change that you can do to an already drilled ball. But more importantly, they like changing themselves. Right. Which comes to the human element. Right. What can they do with the ball? Like in the video illustration of that 20, you know, 45 and 80. That has more influence on the ball than you trying to drill up different ball layouts, you know? Correct. So the, the key here, I think, is, is finding something that works for your game, that you're comfortable with, on the conditions that you more often bowl on, and then stick with it, you know? I think yeah. that's the biggest advice that I give most of my bowlers. You know, now, if you're going to have 12 balls in your bag, well, then, yeah, maybe you might need that two-inch pin or that, you know, five-and-a-half-inch pin one but you don't need 10 of them. You just right. need maybe one at best. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of bowlers, that's what's confusing to them is, is they think that, you know, I need all these balls with all these different layouts in order to fill out my arsenal. Whereas it's, it's more like, Hey, you probably need a ball that's laid out the same, but just has different dynamics and different cover uh, yeah. potential. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I, I've, I've worked with a lot of bowlers in, in not only in private settings, but in camp settings. And I'll take a peek at their bag, you know, and I'll ask them, I said, so tell me what's different about these balls and how do they work differently on the lane? And sometimes they'll come back and they're kind of perplexed. You know, they're going like, well, I, I they're only maybe three boards apart, you know, between all of them. You know, there, there's, right. not, there's not a lot of movement on the approach. And I'm like, well, that's your first big mistake. Right. you got to have more separation if you're going to start lugging these things in. Yeah. They've got to be able to open up the environment so that you can explore a lot of different options, a lot of different angles, you know, you know, on the lane. So, you know, I think that's, you know, I can't stress it enough that you want some kind of versatility. Versatility in the cover, number one versatility in your RGs, and then kind of get a standardization in your pin positions, you know, so that you know what they're always going to do. Now, is that it, typically if, if you have a new customer come to you that you've never seen them throw the ball before, how is it that you determine kind of what their, their the best layout is for their game? Well, the first thing that's going to help me understand a little bit more about them is, you know, when I watch a bowler, there's a couple things that I'm looking for. I'm looking for not only the style, you know, where they're comfortable playing, because it, you, you, we're creatures of habit. We stand in the same spot almost every time, you know, we're targeting the same location on the, on the lane, you know, so I can kind of get an idea of why those first few shots, where they are, you know, if they haven't moved in five or 10 shots, um, normally they're pretty much the same spot at the league yeah. versus where they're, you know, here at the ITRC or at league. So that's one thing. The second thing that I look for is, you know, how fast are they rolling it? Um, you know, what angle of rotation are they rolling it at? What's their tilt? So I'll get all those numbers 
because that's going to help me in to understand what surface do I need to pick, what are G values I might need, how am I might like drill it up, you know. So that'll drive me in the direction of of a layout for them, you know. And then if they have you know other balls in their bag, I'll look to see if they've experimented in the past with different pin positions. You know, they they might be working with pro shop operators that have that mindset where you put the pin here, put the pin here and there, and it's going to do something different. And it really isn't, you know, right. or we're changing surfaces. That's a big difference. Right. So, and I try to explain them and I might even show them. I might even change the surfaces a little bit to show them how to ex expand that bag a little bit. So right. it kind of gives them some insight into what they really have. You know? now, now, when you, when you, you know, are dealing with somebody who's more of a league bowler that's not as comfortable moving around the lane as, as like a pro, do you try to recommend equipment to them that will allow them to stay in that same place for a longer period of time in their comfort zone? Yeah, well then I'll then I'll make sure that the RG values are are, are very different, you know, because um, as the lane dries up, you know, it doesn't get oilier. You know, people think that the lanes do get oily over time. Um, in reality, it never does. But um, the idea here is if they're comfortable just only in a certain area, then as the lane dries up in that spot, I need to push that energy value in their hand further down away from them because that lane's drying up very quickly. So I need to get that energy to delay so that they can retain some, some energy at the back end for it to then make the turn. So, um, you know, I'll change RG values, um, probably not so much pin positions, um, but I will change surfaces as well. You know, those are the two big factors. RG, you know, the mild reactive. Gotcha. So to yeah. wrap it, to wrap up the whole conversation, it, it, no matter who's out there listening, whether they have one ball or six balls or 26 balls, what, what a, approach would you try to explain so that it works for everybody to building your arsenal? I think the big thing, the building your arsenal is um, make sure there's differences in RG in your bag. You know, uh, that's a first and foremost. Um, and then the second biggest thing, you know, or even first big thing is the cover stock types, because in the end, that's what you're changing. You're changing the cover stock types. So you got to have some, you know, very aggressive cover. Um, and that aggressive cover may not be the most, you know, biggest ball in your bag as far as shape, but it definitely is going to start earlier. It's going to interact with that oil volume quickly. Um, and then you want a different cover that's going to get further down the lane and then have a different reactivity in the back end. It's going to have more, you know, more change of direction, more flippier, more angular. That's a, that's a big difference right there. And then the other thing then is your RGs. Make sure that one starts earlier and one a little later down the lane, you know. So start separating them out not only in cover stock strengths, but in distances. And I think you can cover just about any part of the lane on any condition possible, you know, and that's if you don't change much. Yeah. You yeah. add that element of physicality and changing your versatility with rotation. And those balls just magnified, you know, three, four times over. Right. 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 And that's a huge, that's huge. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, I could I could talk about this forever. I'm sure you could too, and I'm sure you know we, we've got a lot of questions that uh, we'll we'll answer you know in in the comments. But um, uh, definitely love to have you on again. You know here here pretty soon once we uh, once we know what people are interested in hearing about next. But um, yeah, uh, you know thanks for so much for your time today. I really really learned a lot and uh, appreciate you you know helping educate our our. Uh, our, our uh, bowling community out there about, uh, um, you know, equipment. Where can people find you if they're looking for uh, some more Lou help? You know, they can directly email me, um, lou.marquez at bowl.com. I'm pretty accessible that way. Um, or uh, just reach us out on Facebook, you know, on our RTRC page. Might be able to answer through there. Um, we're getting that going, you know, more, uh, more and more. And then um, just uh, – you know, inquire, pick up the phone, call us out here at, uh, at the RTRC at the center. So we love to, I love to talk to them. I, I'm always on the phone, you know, troubleshooting with people and interacting with them and, you know, half the time sharing a lot of stuff with them. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. 
Awesome. I know, I know it's tough to get you for today because you got so many lessons and stuff going on. But yeah, so. people want to get out there again. You know? <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's kind of funny, you know, with with everything going on, we've got a sort of you know, a hurricane, you know, it's just yeah, you know, right. yeah. up our shores. And um I, I was working today with uh, an evacuee. Just oh, happened wow. to be yeah, he evacuated yesterday. How about that? He's he's a devout bowler, and he says, "You know what? As soon as this is all over, I'm going to get back to the bowl. So we <laughs> want to make sure to get ready for his league." Awesome. Well, yeah. uh, thanks for everything you're doing. Uh, it's I know it's I know it's making a big difference in the bowling world, and I know people want to know how to build you know these arsenals because there's so much information out there, and it's sometimes it can be so hard to to parse through it all. So thanks for everything you're doing to help you know, educate people and make, make the process easier for them. Thank you, Jason, for having us on. Yeah, very okay. good. Have a good one. That was Lou Marquez, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, he does so much. I mean, we talked about equipment today, but he's so knowledgeable in so many different areas, whether it's, you know, fitting or, you know, training, uh, lane play. So he's definitely somebody we're going to be having on the show uh, quite a few times over the next, uh, over the course of, you know, the run of, of, of this show. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, like I said, if you have any questions, you can ask them below. We'll get to them, uh, in the comments, you know, either on YouTube or on the, uh, on the Facebook page. And, uh, uh, you know, we could even bring, bring Lou back on, like I said, and, and, and answer him there. And maybe you could even end up being, you know, the topic for a whole new show. But, uh, anyway, thanks for watching today. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, be sure to check out all the other great content we've got on, on Bull TV here this week. And uh, uh, hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. And uh, remember, on Bull TV, bowling lives here.